you, Siegfried. So I hope everybody is still awake. I will try to keep the state alive. <laughs> so we will talk about discontinuities of the fossil record. Why? Because every theory makes certain predictions. And also Darwinian theory makes certain predictions. And we can look if nature confirms those predictions or not. So for example, uh, Darwinian theory predicts that we should find in, in the history of life this so-called top-down pattern. So if we look at the differentiation of biological disparity, we first should find in the earliest organisms slight differences developing, growing into bigger differences. So specific differences should grow into generic differences, family differences, and so on, until you finally reach phylum differences. But what we actually find in the fossil record, as most of you will know with this example of the Cambrian explosion, is the sudden appearance of the phyla. So this whole prediction is, uh, in a way, turned upside down. You find uh, not this uh, uh, bottom-up process that you would expect from Darwinian theory, but you find the top-down process with the big difference appearing first without visible precursors. But this is not the only prediction that Darwinism makes. There is a much more important uh, prediction, and that is gradualism. And it's not for nothing that Darwin wrote in his magnum opus uh, a Latin sentence six times, uh, natura non facet saltus, nature doesn't make jumps. And there's a reason why he made this in spite of warnings of his friend Huxley. Uh, that Darwin emphasized this gradualism because Darwin wanted to present a naturalistic explanation. He was aware any kind of non-gradual processes, kind of saltational processes, are in conflict with naturalistic explanation. And it's not just a fact of history. Uh, this is still an essential and not an optional part of evolutionary theory. Uh, and you can see in Richard Dawkins' writings, 2009, he wrote in, in uh, The Great Straw on Earth, Evolution not only is a gradual process, as a matter of fact, it has to be gradual if it is to do any explanatory work. And by the way, this has nothing to do with uh, stuff like uh, punctuated equilibria. Punctuated equilibria of Gould is still a kind of gradualism. This affects just specific uh, to, uh, species to species transition, not, uh, uh, let's say, what we would call macro evolution. So, Gradualism is something that is very essential to the explanatory power of the Darwinian or neo-Darwinian paradigm. And uh, of course, Darwin was quite aware that the fossil record is in conflict with this prediction. And Darwin said, well, that's probably because of the incompleteness of the fossil record. And that was a quite legit uh, uh, explanation in his time. And still in the 20th century, famous paleontologist, vertebrate paleontologist, uh, Philip Ginkerich, he said, well, gaps of evidence are gaps of evidence and not evidence of gaps. So in a way, these uh, discontinuities that we find in the fossil records are artifacts of undersampling and of our poor knowledge of the fossil record and of the incompleteness of the fossil record. But it's not really out there in nature. And, but we can test this. And th there was a nice uh, uh, suggestion made by my colleague Paul Nelson. And he suggested, well, imagine you have a new hobby, beach combing. And you walk along the beach, and the first day you do it, you find snails and mussels. And the next day, you find other snails and other mussels. But every day, you find interesting new stuff. But the longer you do it, the more repetition will occur. And then you end up at a certain day where stuff <laughs> always you find the same stuff over and over again. And it's very difficult to find new things. And actually, this is long known and is used in paleontology. And it's called the so-called collector's curve. And the collector's curve is just like a spreadsheet. You have a horizontal axis. That's the effort you have to invest as a paleontologist to find something new. You can count this in man hours or in energy or in grant money, whatever <laughs> you want to use as, as uh, a factor here to, to count the, the effort. And in the vertical axis, you have the new stuff, the new taxa that you discover. And in the beginning, you have a very steep curve. You just have to invest few, uh, few uh, energy or few time to find a lot of new stuff. And later, then, this curve flattens. And you have to invest a lot of manpower, a lot of grant money. You have to dig a lot around uh, the whole Earth to find interesting new fossils. And this you can test statistically over different groups of organisms. And this has been done uh, in, in mainstream papers published in Nature. 
And overall, in most groups, we have now sufficient statistical studies to say that we have reached this point of saturation where we can say that gaps that we find in the fossil record are not artifacts of undersampling, but are really discontinuities that, there are, uh, that were out there in the history of life. And if I, uh, when I now introduce to you some of those discontinuities, and I will tell you, well, uh, certain groups appeared in a 10 million years, uh, years window of time, <laughs> then this sounds like a lot of time. But what you have to keep in mind is that according to standard textbook wisdom, the average lifespan of uh, animal species, if it is invertebrates or vertebrates, is between two and a half and 10 million years. So a 10 million years window of time for a vertebrate is just two successive species. So that is abrupt in terms of, of the history of life. So before we start with the first discontinuity, we have to know one thing, and that is an event in Earth history very early that is called the late heavy bombardment that happened between 4.1 and 3.8 billion years ago. And that is a time where a large part, the, 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 the majority of the meteorite matter arrived on Earth with about a dozen very big impacts of impactors of a size of partly of 500 kilometers diameter compared to 20 kilometers diameter for the meteor that uh, is said to have uh, killed off the large dinosaurs. So in this time, the oceans were evaporated several times, which is still uh, acknowledged in nature papers published two years ago. And before life was impossible. And we find the oldest life 3.8 billion years ago, not after a long period of chemical evolution, but at the very first moment in the history of Earth, where life could even survive the conditions on, on Earth. And even photosynthesis, which is one of the most complex uh, physiological <laughs> processes in, in, in the living realm, we meanwhile have evidence uh, for appearance 3.8 billion years ago at the very end of the late heavy bombardment where these complex uh, uh, proteins originated and the, these photosystems 1 and 2 which you would expect after Darwinian predictions to find after many hundreds of millions of years of accumulation of chemical evolution and mutation and selection and so on going on and not at the very first moment where life was possible. And then the next dramatic event is one of the evolutionary explosions, the Avalon explosions, where we find this strange Ediacaran pre-Cambrian first macro fossils, the first fossils uh, which are distinguishable as, as, as organisms even for a layman, very alien kind of organisms. Nobody knows what they are, if they are animals, plants, fungi, or whatever, with a very strange symmetry of fractal growth, uh, structure like an air mattress, no visible inner organs, and they appear within 10 million year window of time without any precursors prior in the fossil record. And then they go extinct, and they are followed by the Cambrian explosion, which has been called Evolution's Big Bang. And that is this time. Uh, Steve has written a book about the Cambrian explosion where 21 of the 28 known animal phyla, whatever phyla is, these Linnaean categories are, of course, more or less arbitrary, but what it refers to is simply different body plans, different ways to, to construct a, a multicellular bilateral animal body. And you find most of them appearing suddenly in the Cambrian explosion in this 20 million years window of time. The real pulse of innovation is just in a 5 million years window of time. And there are no precursors. The Ediacaran animals are clearly, or organisms or whatever you want to call them, are clearly not the precursors of the bilaterian animals. And of course, it was tried to explain this unpleasant fact away. And the, the most uh, uh, mostly used uh, explanation was to say, well, probably the sediments were not avail available to find the precursors. And therefore, it's just an artifact of the geological record that we didn't find the uh, ancestors of the Cambrian animal phyla. And this was a legend explanation until a, a few years ago. In 2011 and 2016, we found uh, geological layers of the Burgess Shale type. Burgess Shale is this famous Cambrian locality where all those uh, uh, Cambrian animals are found in Canada. 
and we found exactly the same sedimentary geological uh, formations from an Ediacaran period, from a Precambrian period in Mongolia and China. Animals could be clearly preserved in the same way as in the Burdish Shale, but all we find in these layers are algae. And meanwhile, even the mainstream evolutionary biologists agree it's not an artifact that the animals are not there. Uh, they are not there because they did not exist at this time. Another attempt to explain the Cumbrian explosion away was this so-called small shelly fauna. And what you have here is a time axis of Earth history. Here's the transition between the Precambrian and the Cambrian. Here's the Ediacaran time. Here's the Cambrian time. And this small shelly fauna is very diverse in the Cambrian. Then you have this very thin line. This means less diverse in the Ediacaran. And people said, well, maybe this thin line here, this less diverse uh, small shelly fauna in the Ediacaran were the precursors of the small shelly fauna in the Cambrian. And the small shelly fauna in the Cambrian are basically just fragments of animal exoskeletons from arthropods and echinoderms and so on. The problem is that in this whole argument, there's a fallacy of equivocation involved because these two small shelly faunas have nothing, but really nothing in common. What you find in the Ediacaran shelly fauna are totally different organisms, basically just two different kinds of organisms, Clodinia and Namacolatus. And we know that these cannot be the ancestors of the Bilaterian Cambrian phyla. Why? Because we have, meanwhile, so many discoveries of these animals with growth patterns that we know that, for example, Clodinia had a branching growth pattern, like a plant or like a coral, uh, which does not occur in Bilaterian animals. So most of the experts now agree. Uh, either they consider these as problematica, or most of them now say they are of the cylindrical grade, so related to jellyfish and, and corals, but no bilaterian animals. So there is no continuity between the Ediacaran in terms of the, the shelly fauna. Another argument that was quite uh, convincing until recently was trace fossils. So you not only have fossils in the fossil record of animals, but also of the traces they leave behind when they dig burrows or walk on the ground. <coughs> and there were traces from the Ediacaran that look strangely like walking animals, like these, uh, these traces, like a bulldozer uh, running over the over mud, uh, looking like an arthropod that walked here, or these traces looking like a burrowing trace from a worm, uh, or, or here, also these parallel lines. And People said, well, that's probably the ancestors of the, the Cambrian uh, animal phyla. And they were soft bodies, and they lived up on the, on the seafloor. And we only have the traces. And later, they developed skeletons for some reason. The problem is all these traces turned out to be artifacts. There was a study in 2016 by Mariotti et al. And what they did is they said, well, in the Ediacaran and the Precambrian, there was one very striking thing of the biotopes that were bacterial mats. All the seafloor was sealed by bacterial mats. And they thought, let's grow these bacterial mats in our aquarium tank and stir them up and see what happens. What you see here are the real trace fossils from the Ediacaran. What you see here, one-to-one -one correspondence, are simple artifacts, folding structures uh, of these bacterial mats, mats when they stirred up and you let them settle and you get exactly the same traces. The same is true for other traces that are uh, uh, reported from the Ediacaran. There are no, there is no continuity of traces from the Ediacaran to the Cambrian. So also this exp explanation or this explaining away of the suddenness of the Cambrian explosion has failed. So the next explosion that we find is in the next age, in the Ordovician, about 407 million years ago. And what we find there is a very sudden, massive increase in biodiversity of the marine invertebrate animals. And it is such dramatic that it has been called life's second Big Bang. This also happens in just a few million years window of time, very sudden in, in terms of, of uh, biological history. And in the next age in Earth history, in the transition from the Silurian to the Devonian, about 400 million years ago, you have this origin of land biota, of land plants that are necessary, of course, for animal life to go uh, on land. And this is also so abrupt, so sudden, that it has been called 
a, a terrestrial equivalent of the Cambrian explosion of, of marine faunas. No transition uh, between pre simple precursors gradually developing into land plants. The earliest land plants we found we can already attribute to modern uh, orders and, and suborders of, of land plants. And then in the Devonian 400 million years ago, we have something that is not for nothing called a revolution, the Devonian Necton Revolution. Now in marine life, you have three possible types how you can live. You can live confined to the ground, that is called demersial way of life. You can live planktonic, passively drifting in the ocean, or you can be an active swimmer like fish or cephalopods. And what you see here is a time axis, and here the percentage of marine life according to their lifestyle. So you see, until this point in time, the majority was planktonic, the rest was living uh, confined to the ground, immersial, but only very few were active swimmers. And then within a 10 million year window of time, you have reversed this complete thing, and 90% of the, the uh, diversity is uh, active swimmers, and uh, only the minority are still planktonic or demersial. That is called the Devonian Necton Revolution, and it's correlated with something else, and that is the appearance of hard structures in the jaw, uh, these tooth-like structures in different groups of jawed vertebrates, like uh, Cartilaginaeus fish, like the lowfin fish, and the rayfin fish. And in my own group, I'm an insect paleontologist. If you look at the origin of winged insects, all those different orders, that is the large categories like butterflies, and then you have 120,000 species of butterflies or beetles, and then you have 600,000 species of beetles, or locusts and, and cockroaches and mayflies and dragonflies and bugs and so on. Nearly all of them appear in the upper Carboniferous out of nothing without any kind of precursors, and it's not only the primitive forms, what we would call primitive, like cockroaches or locusts or mayflies, but meanwhile even Holometabolous groups like beetles and, and wasps that have this complex metamorphosis with this pupal stage where the complete body is dissolved in a kind of soup and, and you have this resting stage where it is reorganized then the, the uh, caterpillar is reorganized into the butterfly out of this soup and this would have to be expected to originate after many uh, accumulation time of, of mutations uh, after the origin of pterygoid or winged insects, but they appear contemporaneous with the oldest winged insects we know in the fossil record. And in the next age, in the Triassic, we have a kind of carpet bombing of explosions. There has been a book by Peter Ward, who is an outspoken uh, uh, opponent of intelligent design. I think you had once a, a debate with Peter Ward. He has written a book out of thin air and in his book he wrote that uh, in the Triassic uh, you had a kind of explosion that was as important for animal life on land as the Cambrian explosion was for marine animal life. And some examples of these multiple explosions are the sudden appearance of uh, uh, terrestrial tetrapods, the first relatives of mammals, the first and oldest relatives of, of lizards, the oldest relatives of crocodiles, of turtles and of the dinosaur bird group appearing again in a nine million year window of time. Remember, that's just two successive vertebrate species. And even more striking, if you look at marine reptiles, today we only know turtles and maybe marine iguanas from the Galapagos Island. Before the, the end Permian mass extinction event, there were no marine reptile groups known. And afterwards, we had, after a few million years, 15 different families with very diverse <coughs> body plans, and most striking maybe ichthyosaurs, where you have just a four and a half million year window of time to get a transition from a lizard-like land-living animal to a completely fish-like uh, uh, viviparous uh, animal looking like a dolphin, or uh, to get this transition within the lifespan of a single uh, vertebrate species, larger vertebrate species. In a two million year window of time, we find the appear, sudden appearance without precursors of flying and gliding in different groups of reptiles, including the first active flyers, uh, pterosaurs. And also dinosaurs appear very abruptly. We have in 2019 a paper in Nature Communication which said it's amazing how clear cut the change from no dinosaurs to all dinosaurs was in the upper Triassic. 
And of course, Darwin knew of another example, which he called the abominable mystery, the sudden appearance of flowering plants with their complex reproductive structures. They appear out of nowhere in the, the transition from the upper Jurassic to the lower uh, uh, Cretaceous. And in a paper of 2015, Oskin said then, about 125 million years ago, angiosperms, that's flowering plants, and their flowers sprang forth during the Cretaceous period as fully formed as Aphrodite. Same with butterflies. They appear out of nothing in the Paleogene without uh, precursors in different families, already modern representative of modern families. The same you find in, in modern birds after the Cretaceous and Cretaceous mass extinction event. And the same with mammals. And if you look at uh, modern mammal orders, that would be groups like elephants and artiodactyls and whales and carnivores and so on and primates. Uh, this is the most modern uh, molecular phylogenetic tree of mammals. The time axis, the dating, is based on molecular clock, most modern with use a relaxed clock uh, with multiple fossil calibration points. And you see here the red dots are the actual oldest fossil finds. You find them all in this yellow region in this, uh, this short period in the Paleogene. And None of it where they should be according to the, the uh, molecular clock dating of the branching events. And when they appear, they appear with their distinctive body plans. One example, bats. This is the oldest bat we know from the Green River Formation in America 52 and a half million years ago. This is the skeleton of a modern bat. Uh, they uh, uh, are basically indistinguishable from, from <coughs> modern bats and we don't have any precursors and it's similar in, in the other mammalian orders as well. And even if we look at Homo, some of uh, you may think, well, we have all those fossil humans and then you have this gradual transition from ape-like forms to, to the genus Homo. Well, John Hawkes, one of the most uh, uh, well-known uh, paleoanthropologists, thinks otherwise and he wrote a paper in 2000 that has been uh, 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 announced in the public as the Big Bang theory of human evolution because it's not like that. If you compare Australopithecines, these more ape-like forms, and the first representatives of the genus Homo, you find a vast discontinuity in a lot of typical characters for the genus Homo where you don't find a gradual transition from Australopithecus to, to Homo. And it's even true if you look at human cultural origin. There, there, uh, if you distinguish between different, let's say, items that humans can do from uh, stone tools to, to cave paintings, and you distinguish between mere tool use and uh, things that give some indication for symbolic thinking, life carving or uh, decorative things or, or uh, cave paintings, uh, the brown uh, stuff is, is uh, our invention that have to do with symbolic thinking. The green things are more or less tool use uh, restricted. Uh, then there is a time where you have a sudden increase of evidence for symbolic thinking, and that has been called the human, uh, the upper Paleolithic human revolution. So also here you find the discount. So discontinuities are not restricted to the Cambrian explosion. That is not an exception from the rule, but it's over all periods of Earth history in all groups of organism. It's, it's rather the rule. And this creates several problems. One problem, of course, is the contradiction to the prediction, the gradualistic prediction of Darwinism. But there's also this waiting time problem, and we will hear more uh, about the mathematical side of this problem by the talk uh, from Ola Hersier. Uh, I think it's tomorrow on the schedule. And, uh, but basically, this waiting time problem means if you compare the windows of time that are established for certain transitions in the fossil record, for, for example, for the transition between a pig-like uh, ancestor of whales, uh, like Pachycetus, uh, and to, to the first really whale-like form, dolphin-like forms like Dorodontida or Basilosauride, there is only a window of time remaining of about four to five million years. And this transition requires a lot of reconstruction. And if you look, at, is this window of time sufficient to accommodate the necessary genetic changes in terms of can these changes occur in the population and can they spread in the population? Then you get a real problem for the mathematical feasibility of the neo-Darwinian process. And that is the so-called waiting time problem. 
And to finish my talk, if we do what we should do to make look in the past and make an inference to the best explanation, we can certainly now say with our knowledge that we cannot explain away all this conflicting evidence anymore with this artifact hypothesis that's an undersampling artifact of an incomplete fossil record. That's no longer true. So the evidence clearly falsifies key predictions from the neo-Darwinian theory. And then we can ask what explains the evidence better. And if we look at the suddenness of the appearance of novel body plans and of the amount of genetic information that is necessary to make these body plans realize, to make them happen, then the, if you choose between the two possibilities, either infusion from outside of information from outside of the system in terms of intelligent design, or a mechanistic bottom-up process like the neo-Darwinian process, an unguided search through, through the, the genetic search space, then the intelligent design, I think, qualifies as the better explanation of the at least the paleontological evidence. And then, of course, we'd have to look at all the evidence, and that, uh, genetic evidence, biogeographic evidence, and so on, and have to decide which hypothesis is the best explanation for all the evidence. So I want to finish with this, hope everybody will now be glad that it's over and can take some sleep, especially the overseas guests. Thank you.